Uh, if you can imagine living life and being uh, in literally obscurity, in other words, nobody knows who you are. You're just living life. Your name's Peter, and one's named James, one name's John. You got 12 guys that just pretty much had uh, just, just fishing, living life. And then from 30 years before that, though, uh, a baby was born in Bethlehem, and God stepped out of eternity, wrapped himself in flesh, lived in the Jerusalem area for some time, and then he started walking along the shores and calling these men to come with, be a part of his life. In so doing, he began to share with them and invest in them and build things into them, and he said some things to them to remind them there were two things that he left unfinished. When Jesus left this earth, he left a mission unfinished, and he left a message unfinished. The gospel is not as hard as people make it out to be. It's just a mission. It's just a message. And he shared that with us. You know, uh, perhaps you've heard about the congregation that had decided to build a new church. Mm -hmm. A building committee was chosen, and soon they began meeting regularly. After many meetings and much discussion, the building committee passed the following resolutions. We shall build a new church. Second, the new building is to be located on the side of the old building. The material in the old building is to be used in the construction of the new building. We shall continue to use the old building until the new building is complete. How many know people don't like change? Literally what that was saying is, ain't nothing changing. We're going to make the old with the, the new end of the old. Nothing is changing. And we are creatures of habit. That's why <clears throat> even when I ask you to move up or sit different or do something like that, I appreciate you changing just a little bit. Some of you made a little move tonight. You moved up a little closer, got a little closer to me. Those online starting to come to church. You know, that's just a good thing because we are creatures. We don't like to change. We like for things to stay the way they are. You know, a, a, a new pastor was commenting on one of his church members about the many years that he had been a member of the church. The pastor said, yeah, I'm sure you've been a lot. You've seen a lot of changes in all your years. The man replied, yeah, and I've been against every one of them. Some people just against every change that's going to take place. In life, how many know change is coming? Yeah. If you don't make a change, if you don't, because life's going to change around you, so you have to start changing with it. The book of Acts, Acts is a book about Jesus beginning to do and to teach. And that's all he did. He did and he taught. He do and he teach until his ascension and what the believers did after Jesus ascended. The book of Acts reveals things that are changing. Acts is a book that tells us the Jewish clock had stopped ticking, and the dispensation of grace that brought us Gentiles into this thing had just started to begun. And I, I love that. Acts is one of the most exciting books in the New Testament. It records the ascension of Jesus, the history of the early church, and the ascended Christ was the head of the church and the help and the hope. Sunday I said to you that there were three things I want to see out of every church, every service. I want to see people get help, hope, and healing. Help, hope, and healing. That every time you come to church, one, at least one of the things you got hold of. You got some help, you got some hope, you got some healing. That's a powerful thing. Acts 1, verse 11, 1 through 11 says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles from whom he had chosen, to whom he also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, that means after his death and resurrection, 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to what? What, is, what was pertaining to? The kingdom. You would wonder what was he going to talk about when he came back from the grave. It was still the kingdom of God. Verse 8 says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You're going to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, both in Crosby, both in Houston, and the uttermost parts of the world, which is Texas. Amen. And in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And then he had spoken these things. While they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood behind, by them in white apparel, which also said, Hey, you men of Galilee, why are you looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go up into heaven. Now, when I read this and I think about two men, again, this is another one. Of two angels. Standing beside all those guys in Galilee saying, why y'all looking up? In other words, get after it. Do what he told you to do. Quit standing and staring up at the sky, thinking something else is going to change. you got to get after it. And Jesus left them this and for us this, this mission. First, he left the church an unfinished mission. Three times in the Gospels and once in the book of Acts, he told us what to do. Go. 
Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And listen, I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the world. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, 47. And that, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And again, we just read Acts 1, 8. You shall receive power after that. The reason this is so important is, is you have two or three witnesses. You have, not only do you have Matthew, but you got Mark and you got Luke saying the same thing that Jesus said. That, look, we got to go, we got to teach, we got to preach. And he told us what to say. Uh, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So these were the witness or the things that we were to help. We are to witness of his work consistently on our lips. We are to witness by our warmness the challenge of our love. Probably harder than it talk is easy. Sunday I preached a message. The title was Love is a Verb. Amen. It's easier to talk this thing than it is to walk this thing. So it's important that you warm up with love to people. He also taught us where to serve. He said Jerusalem, our local areas. This is Jerusalem to us. It's Crosby. It's Channel View. It's Dayton. It's this area, our families, our workplaces, our city, this area here, Huffman, this around here. Then Judea, which stretches out into the cities and other communities, the wider part of Houston. The worst thing, guys, that we can do in life is become so close-minded to think Crosby is all there is. There's a big world out there. I mentioned to you the other day, there's 7 billion people in the world. 300 million of them are us. And we're just a tiny part of that 300 million. Everybody understand that. So that's 6.7 billion people still out there that need to hear the gospel of Jesus. They need to know that Jesus loves them, amen, he cares for them, and there's hope and there's healing and there's help for them. Judea, our Samaria, our state, uttermost parts of the earth, home and foreign missions. You know, uh, when, when, when life is over, I mean, I've, seen this, I've seen these little memes about this and stuff like that, but that, that when, I, when I die, I want to slide into heaven yelling, wow, what a wonderful ride it was. You know, and, and probably most of us are going to slide in with some worn out bodies. We're going to need a new body. Aren't you glad you got that promise that when you get there that God said, okay, come in and drag in what you got? Thank God it ain't that way that we're going to get something new when we get there. I, I pray that all of you have that same attitude. You, you need to pray that God will give you the health and the ability to work faithfully for his kingdom. Literally spending your life for him. Because there's no retirement in the kingdom of God. You stay at this thing. You keep right on pre and that. And again, I feel this excitement rising as we're moving toward the, this muscle car Sunday. There's something about the freshness of new people. You know, we had one, we had somebody show up new here Sunday, and it was like, I was preaching to him. And he loved it when church was over. I get to the other campus, there's new faces there. And they, they just want to be a part, and they're crying, and they're teared up, and, they're going, and it's like, why didn't you find us sooner? We've been here a long time. Well, the reason why, we ain't told them. We ain't said nothing. We got to advertise more with our lips and with our, or with our hands and what we do, reaching out to people. So he left his church, our church, the church, unfinished mission. It's our job. It's simple. Everybody say it's our job. You know, as, as fathers, it's a job to be, good, to be good fathers, to be good husbands, mothers, to be good moms and, and, and wives. I understand that. But it's our job as believers to be able to teach and to be able to share the gospel and this mission to go after people. We're to share the good news of salvation. And it, it's, it's the best thing ever happened to me. It is absolutely the best thing. I mean, I look at, again, what happened to Peter, James, and John? What happened if Jesus had to come along? They, Peter would have still been working for James and John's daddy. Because James and John, the, they worked for Zebedee. Their, their father's name was Zebedee. That's, that was the fishing company, Zebedee Fishing Company. All right? And, and they would still be working for him. But from then on, they became fishers of men, became famous. I wonder what Peter thinks about the, uh, all the, the, the churches in Rome named after him. And after they actually said he was the pope. Now, that's funny. And again, if you're a former Catholic, I'm not trying to offend you. But I'm just going to tell you something straight up. Peter was a married man. He was a wild child. You know, and I know popes are supposed to be pure and all this other stuff. Pete had to laugh. He's still got to laugh. But evidently, he's the one we're going to meet at the gate. The Bible never says that, but evidently, it's going to be Peter. Because every joke I ever heard that we're going to meet him when we get to the gate. I don't care. I don't care about meeting Peter. I'll talk with him when I get there. I want to see Jesus. I want to see my daddy. I want to see my sister. I want to see for 30, uh, almost 30 years of preaching funerals, the people that I know that love God, that I'm going to see again. And they're going to be looking good. Amen. Hair and all. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, if you want it back, you may not want it back. You may like that. Okay. All right. But the second thing Jesus left us was, uh, again, was this unchallenged message. 
when he left, he said he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, which simply means because I love him, I want to see him again. And it's seen of them 40 days of speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The kingdom is the king's domain. You know, over the next few weeks, we'll preach on thy kingdom come. It's a part of the, our muscle car Sunday. It's our thought that we're throwing out there. It is the invisible kingdom of God. You're in it now, the kingdom of God. It's not just when we get there, because when he said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's here now. But let's talk about what that means. It's a place where we understand, appreciate, and comprehend the purpose, intent, goal, and objectives of God and mankind's relationship to him and his creation. No one that I know that loves God looks at their children and say, Man, I hope you grow up to be a failure. I hope you grow up not to impact the world. I hope what you do in life has no purpose. We don't do that. If you were like me, you pray over your children when they're little. You go in there with their pillow and you put scripture underneath their, 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 their pillow. You, it's better to pray for them when they're sleeping, then they don't interrupt you. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and at that moment, you like them more. And I don't care how old they get, if you get a chance to catch them sleeping, I don't care, 17, 18, and 19, you're still going over there and pray over them. I, I, I prayed over my son tonight. Amen. I just something about, I, I just want to see God, because I don't believe God gave me kids to be failures. Amen. I, I believe in that. And it's the same with Jesus. When he brought you into the fold, he doesn't want any of us to be failures. Again, let's look at the invisible kingdom of God. as a place where we understand, appreciate, comprehend the purpose, intent, goal, and objectives of God and mankind's relationship to him and the creation. I talk with so many people. They tell me about what's going on today. And you got to talk to this younger generation. They understand the technology and this intellig uh, artificial intelligence and all these things that are coming on and, and, and all of these different cultures that are out there. And all I want to do is bring it back to the kingdom of God. I want to see the kingdom of God affect this culture. I want to see people understand it. It was the priority. Jesus had the kingdom first. It's his highest priority, restoring the kingdom of heaven on earth. It is the why Jesus came. He, came, he didn't come here just to save us. He came, he, that's, a, that's a byproduct. He came here to introduce us to the kingdom of God. It was everything to him. He preached all about it. And the more you see it, it's like, I did not see it there. He preached the kingdom, taught the kingdom. It was central to everything he did and said. Say it was his last sermon before he left earth. In other words, the last thing you say before you go is one of the most important things you may ever say. Everyone needs to hear this, for it is what we are seeking. It's the kingdom. It's that, it's that which fills us. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Those three things, right, being right with God, peace, and joy. If you've got them working in your life, you got wholeness working in your life. When you can be joyful over bad things that are going on around you and you still can smile about it because you know that God's got you and everybody else around you. When you have peace in the turmoil of the storms of life, when you can live right or do the right thing, even at, at, when, when it's easier to do. The message says it like this. God's kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach. For goodness sake, it's what God does with your life as he gets it right, puts it together, and completes it with joy. In other words, when we become complete as his children, then that's a part of the kingdom here on earth. It, it, the kingdom of heaven is it literally is heaven getting to earth. I've often said God don't need us now. I actually said that to somebody down on the phone. God don't need us now. Amen. He needs us here. When God's ready for us, he'll take us. But many people are so ready to get on up to heaven. I, I'm, I'm going to go when he wants me to go. But the bottom line is he doesn't need us now. He doesn't need us in the kingdom now. He needs us here on earth. Why? Because this earth needs salt. This earth needs light. It needs that. So the word would be a colony. Now, again, let this sink into your redneck thinking. A group of immigrants or their descendants who settle in a distant land but remain subject to the parent country. Watch this. And we all understand this. In this nation, we are a melting pot. We are not Chinese. We are not Hispanic. We are not uh, Japanese. We're not Arab. We're Americans. But we are mixed with, oh, I'm German. I wonder how many nationalities in this room. If you're, not, if you're different than, than being German, what are you? Somebody tell me. You Welch? What are you? Both of y'all Irish? Native American? Mixed. Irish. Irish. Do you know? Mine's 57. Come on, somebody. Scottish. Mine's 57. Spanish, Spanish, 
Swedish in Spanish. Sweet Spanish. I know what you are, HD. I don't even want to hear it. Texan. Yeah, you try that. That ain't right. You might have been born here, but you come from somewhere else. Ronnie, you know? German. You don't know. You got to ask somebody. Ask your mama. Hey, okay, look at Papa. Papa, what are you? Do you know? Do you know? German. German. So we got some Germans here. And of course, this town, Crosby, is a Czech town, full of Czechoslovakians. That's why you got the ski on the last name. Mahoski, Kolovsky, uh, Kozlovsky, uh, uh, Pro- Prosex, but we're here. I think I might have said that wrong. <laughs> Yeah, but, but that was, it's a Czech community. So look at this definition again. A group of immigrants or their descendants who settle in distant land but remain subject to the parent country. One of the things that bothers us uh, Texans or Americans is they don't integrate with us. They don't in- So we got little Mexico. We got Chinatown. We got, we got all these uh, uh, Arabs in one place. If you, I mean, all over Houston, it, is a, uh, it might be a melting pot. But they have it integrated in with, and, and that's one of the things that our nation tries to do. But the bottom line is, is that what we are doing right here today in this church, as, as, as Swedish and, and, and uh, 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 German and, and Polish and all the different nationalities and Spanish that we are, we come together as the body of Christ from the kingdom of God, from heaven, the thought of God, through our, our parents to get here, and we have incorporated into the church of God or now become the kingdom of God on earth. We are a colony. Come on. We're a colony. And what we're doing is, is we're learning the king's uh, word to us and what, how we're supposed to act in this colony. And so he says in this colony, we should have love, we should have peace, and we should have joy. Hello. In this colony, we ought to forgive one another, love one another deeply, care for one another, help those. It even says in his, in his constitution here from the other kingdom that we should be good to everybody, particularly to the household of faith. In other words, particularly to one another in here. Because if you're not good to people in here, you're sure going to be mean as hell to people out there. Right. Amen. So get good with people in here. Can I get an Amen. So we are colonies. So Jesus preached this thing. What he wanted to see happen was that all the mixture, whether it be Roman, whether it be Jewish, whether it be Gentile, and Paul pushed it in the book of Galatians, in the book of Colossians, for all of us to come together and be a part of the kingdom of God on earth known as the church. So there are many little colonies that are represented here. God help us learn to get along. Amen? Learn to like one another. Realize we're all part of the same kingdom. Same body, amen, of believers, John 17. And listen, I, I finished John 13, and, and you've got to get to John 18 before you start seeing the trials and Gethsemane and things. So I thought, I want to read what Jesus said, because after Judas leaves, what he said to the 11 is important. Now, you need to read it. I almost came here tonight just to read Scripture to you, three chapters. But you need to read the rest of 13, 14, 15, 16, because in chapter 15 is where you got the vine and the branches. He shares that with them, that you're not going to be nothing outside of me. And I keep reading about these prayers he's saying to them. And he says this in chapter 17, I have given them your word, talking to his father. He's praying for his disciples. And the world has hated them. Listen, this colony is despised by the world. This colony doesn't like us. Hollywood can't accept us. I'm not talking about all of Hollywood, but the mainstream liberal uh, people that, that are pushing for their agendas do not like you. So it's important to say to them, listen, I'm not, here, I'm not here to fight with you. I'm here to support the Constitution. And the Constitution tells me this. I'm from another world, actually. If you want to really put me, uh, you realize just how crazy I am. I'm not even from here. You know, you may think I am. I may look German, but I'm actually a part of the kingdom of God. I'm a believer in Christ. Becoming more and more like him every day the best I can. Amen. I tell J.J. every time I see her, David's little daughter, I say, how'd you get prettier today than you were yesterday? Yeah. Oh, she lights up like a light beam, you know, because he loves that. Wouldn't you love that too? Well, maybe not pretty, but handsome. Somebody told me I got handsomer every day. That would make me feel a little better. But, but same way with the church. Every day he looks at us, I hope we get better. Amen. He gives us another day to get better. I, I've given them your word, and the world hates them. I think it's bothersome. When the world likes us. Yeah, we're doing something wrong. If the world loves us all the time, I want to win unbelievers. I want to bring them in. And I can do that through the gospel of Christ, but they have to come in the same way I did through the door of Christ. 
So, so, but when the world starts really light, or when you can't tell the difference in us and them, then, then there's something going on. He says, for they are not of the world anymore. Speaking of his disciples. What, you mean because they got connected with you, Jesus, they're not of the world? No, 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 no. Uh, no more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them. When did they not become of the world? When they became born again. When they connected with me. That's when they did. And the same with us. That's when we got revelation, understanding. We're not of this world. They're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word, your constitution is truth. As you sent me into the world, I sent them into the world. Jesus, his, his idea, this kingdom first, was so simple we miss it. Matthew 6, 31, he says, do not worry. Mm. Say, what are we going to eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. God knows what we need. And it's important to understand that to the place where you trust him in that, or what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live. You know, I'm going to tell you, when that, when that hurricane hit, I didn't know where Joseph was going to live. Man, I didn't know where Joseph was. He's up in Stenerville. I was trying to find people. But we didn't know where we were going to live. Now we look back after a year. They have a home. I have a home. You know, but you just got, sometimes you may have to live in a bunkhouse where you get your home. Amen. Or an RV or something. But, but eventually, he says, don't worry about that. I will take care of you. See, see, it starts as a small thing. Luke chapter 13, verse 18. Then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? Let me think. It's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air perched in its branches. Now, here's some observations that you need to see here about the kingdom of God, the church. It grew. The tree is going to grow. Churches should grow. Bottom line, churches should grow. We should grow spiritually, but our churches should also grow. So it's a mandate for us to do that. Second, it became a great tree. It's going to be big. It's, in other words, and, and again, it does, it, big doesn't mean numerically it means influence. It has influence. So the churches have some influence. And birds will find their rest and security in it. In other words, it becomes a place of shelter. So the kingdom of God is going to grow, it's going to have influence, and it's going to shelter people. People are going to find shelter there, a home for those who choose to soar. Can I get an amen? Talking about the birds getting on out there. So there are aspects of the nature of a tree. The largest living thing on earth is a tree. The largest living thing. The invisible kingdom is the largest living thing on earth. You don't realize how big. The only two places that I know of statistically that is not growing, the church, is America and Europe. Isn't that funny? This is where the church was the strongest at one time, America and Europe. But we started turning to our stuff and hanging on to our stuff, and, and it was, life became all about what we could get and all of this. The next thing you know, we start forgetting it. Sometimes persecution is the best thing for the church and for believers. It drives them closer. I'm not praying for it. I'm not asking for it, but I'm telling you, it will drive you closer to him. You'll know that's when you pray the most. It's when you feel beat up, beat down, or something. when things are going wrong, it drives us to him. Uh, again, it's like 9-11. It drove people into the house. But the church is becoming weaker in America. So we, whose fault is that? It's my fault. It's my fault. And we have to take responsibility for it and say, God, help us with the mission. Help us with the message. You left something unfinished. Help us take care of it and deal with it. The strongest living thing on the earth is a tree. Don't tell me you don't drive by a big tree. I drove out of my way in San Francisco to go look at a tree. I had to see the tree. It's in Muir Woods because I knew that's where the planet of the apes was bouncing around in the movie. If you've not seen it, that's where they were when they had the battle on the bridge. I drove across that bridge. Didn't see no apes, but I saw some big trees. You couldn't get four or five people to stretch around them. One tree, you could drive through it. And I just wanted to see this tree. The, 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 the strongest living thing on the earth is a tree. And they're huge. These sequoias are giant. And you stare at them. And, and even, even any big oak trees, you love them. People want to groom around them. You'll cut all them taller trees down. But you're going to leave them big oaks, man. There's something about them big spread out limbs that just speaks to you. Uh, the oldest living thing on earth is a tree. It's a tree. And it all started with a seed. It's all got to start somewhere. There was somebody today and talking with him, actually a businessman. He said, how did all this start? Because he, he done Googled our church out in, in New Canaan. He Googled this and we were just talking. And I said, well, it all started with 30 people with no money. 
no money in a facility that was borrowing. We weren't even renting it at the time. It grew up from there. Every church I've started, started with just a seed. People that believed just a little bit that we could do this thing. And I said, 16 years later, we own 115 acres in 19, 20, 21 buildings, 22, 23. I hadn't counted years yet, so I forget how many we got. Somebody said, how many employees? I don't even know how many employees I got. I don't know. Uh, we don't know. The bottom line is, everybody's doing their part. And I said, now we're debt free. But it all started with a seed, a thought, a hope, a belief that we could do this thing. And we did it. So when I look at his message, I'm saying, okay, God, we're doing the best we can, but I know that we can do a little bit more. Characteristics of that mustard seed, it decomposes quickly. You know, I talked to you two weeks ago about the seed that goes into the ground. That mustard seed, it, it quickly decomposes. Amen. It's to break up into basic components. It decays quickly. The quicker you die to yourself, the less struggle you're going to have as you get older. The quicker you say to yourself, and then die to yourself with all the things that you know that's been wrong in your life, the less trouble you're going to have as you get older in life. Amen. You'll find out when you're younger, it's easier to whoop something than when you're older. When you're older, you've got to send your boys to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. Boy, when you sneeze, it knocks you off your feet. That's a good sneeze. <laughs> Amen. That there, is, there is power in breaking down all we have built up as a belief system to get back to the original truth. A wrong belief can hurt a right faith. You can have the right faith when you get saved and just come in and sit in church and forget that you've got to find your purpose, you've got to discover what it is, you've got to have a mission, you've got to have a message. All of these things are important. But if you don't understand that, you've got a right faith, but you've got a wrong belief, and you just start sitting. If you sit, you're going to you'll become gospel hardened. Gospel hardened when you've heard too much and you've done too little. You just heard, 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 but you didn't do nothing with what you heard. Pretty soon, your heart was going to get hard. You can say, why is my heart hard? Because I didn't do anything with what I learned. I didn't do anything with what I was taught. But if I do something with this, if I, if I learn how to pray over my kids, if I learn how to love one another, if I learn how to reach out, if I learn how to feed the poor, if I, if I learn how to manage my finances in order to get out of debt quicker in life, if I learn how to do these things properly, then I promise you that I, I have a right faith and I have a right belief system. It looks like it's falling apart when the seed falls, but it's actually breaking stuff off that is not supposed to be there. It's the kind of faith that changes mindsets. And we'll start closing here. The disposition, it is not dull. It's not flat. Its disposition is to grow. And again, a mustard seed is very small, but it grows very fast. It's inclined to grow. It is faith with an attitude. It's saying, I'm going to grow. This year's going to be my year. I'm going to give myself opportunity to grow in you. I love when people tell me, Pastor, I read in the Bible today. Makes you feel good. I read the Constitution today that the king of the kingdom told me here in the colony that I am to spread his word like Johnny Appleseed. I had that young man I was telling you come to my house today, Daniel Boone, nine months in rehab, another six months in a, a, a boy's home. He's 40-something years old, been addicted his whole life, and drugs and stuff, turned his life around, and, and he was told by the drug counselor, find me and find the little country church he said they can help you there so he showed up and he's he, i don't believe he's going to stay with us a little while it's, it's, when i hear that kind of stuff that's somebody that says don't go just anywhere go somewhere you can get fed go somebody where you can learn the kingdom's message amen you get hold of this the dispute matthew said chapter 13 another parable put he forth unto them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which man took and sold in his field which indeed is at the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air become and lodge there in its branches. In other words, it starts out small, but it rapidly grows. You can grow in God as fast as you want to. Justin, I remember when you came in here, but you wanted to start doing something. Next thing I know, you're taking offerings, you're greeting at the door, you're, you, you do, you're out at the ranch, you're doing stuff. You grow as fast as you want to grow. Dusty, I still have mental pictures. You on a tractor last year. And you just got in church with that big grin and beard. But you, got, but you grew as fast as you want to grow. All of us are that way. you got to decide, oh, how, much, how fast do I want to grow? Where do I want to go? And it doesn't always have to be just inside this colony. You can branch out. You know, I, we have people that do things at other churches. But it's still a part of this church. Amen. But they, they're always branching out. They're always doing stuff. I hear about them feeding the poor. Man, blesses me. Going downtown. It's durability and adaptability. It is said of the mustard seed, it will bloom wherever it is planted. 
Be fruitful where you're at. Just be fruitful where you're at. You can plant it in the desert, in the woods of New Caney, here on the streets of Crosby, in the crevice of a rock. It'll begin to grow, and it'll look for moisture to tap into, and it's going to grow through anything. It'll push through stuff. It ain't going to stop. It is the kind of faith that will pray and fast till the answer comes. Matthew 17, 20. For truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to the mountain, remove hence to yonder place. It's going to go. And nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing, not even one thing, impossible, more powerful, or capable of being more powerful. The mountain, you're going to say to the mountain, get up, it's going to move, it's got to rear up, it's got to raise up the voice to keep the mind in suspense. That's the mountain, it's got to go when I say go. And all I got to do is have enough faith. And it's not about the size of the, it's not about the seed, it's the power in it. But you believe in you believe in for it. It's going to happen. Luke 22, for the Lord said to Simon, 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 Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Better pray for you, that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, when you are planted through change, strengthen you, brothers. I've often said, it's what you're going through right now, it's going to help somebody else. You think it's about you, it's not. When God strengthens you, Strengthen somebody else. Amen. Help somebody else. Understand this. Most folk in life have been depressed. Most people I ever met are bipolar. I said it Sunday in the second service. I don't know if I said it here. But everybody I've met is bipolar. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. Eventually, you've got to learn how to level out or learn how to live with what I call circular consistency. In other words, when you up, enjoy it. When you're down, don't be mean to people. Just know you're down. Go get in the cave. Hang out with God until you get back up again. Amen. Monday's my downtime. Amen. I go hide out on Monday. You know, you may not see me stick my head out of the house till midday. Nobody calls. Nobody. I shut my phone off Sunday night before I went to bed. I figured if they need me, they call Joseph. Amen. Just learn how to deal with it. Listen, someday the tree will be harvested. Someday that giant tree will be harvested. The rings will tell the story. I remember how fascinated I was when my dad showed me that. How old's that tree? I don't know how old that tree is, Dad. Dad cut that tree down. He said, count them rings. I started counting. Well, that's 15 years old. 15 rings. He said, well, it's 15 years old. Well, isn't evolution wonderful? Who's dumb enough to believe that? Oh, I forget. There are whole schools out there. Did y'all celebrate atheist uh, national holiday? Monday? It was April Fool's Day. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So surely that must be their holiday. What idiot believes that God didn't do this? Fifteen rings? God did that. So you, you cut that tree down and you start to see all of those rings. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. This was Sunday's message. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but God only who makes things grow. Listen, when you look into that ring that you see there, I want you to notice something. How your faith moved mountains. There's that ring. This ring here is when your son was life flighted and you got through that year. This ring here is when you were on crutches and, and your foot was operating on you got through this. Oh, back on up here. This is when you were 16 and you, you had the drunkies. We had the ran a red light and T-boned a car and you put your hand through a metal dash. And this ring here represents uh, you guys going to the state championship in basketball. And this here ring, you know, all them rings in your life. Some of you are going to have 100 rings, Mr. Hicks. But I've done funerals of 16 rings. I've done funerals of one ring. Some of just get started. But in life, all of those rings matter in your life. How that you've done it. Stand with me. It's the power of belief. And you heard the word. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We hear it. We believe it. We receive it. The promises of God. Without putting ourselves in position to receive, we stay in the same places in our lives. By you even being here tonight, you got to hear the word and put yourself under a place saying, you know what? I understand this. 
Jesus left. And if you take it serious in your heart and say, I, I got a mission to share about the kingdom. I got, I got the message, amen, that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I, I got something I got to do here. I, I, I have a part. And even though I have a job, even though I have a career, even though I, I am who I am, amen, God help me to fulfill that. You know, your position, you position yourself in a doctor's office. You sign in, you sit down, you wait, you call into a meeting room, you're diagnosed by a problem, you receive instruction, you get prescription, you pay your money, you take and you get well. You may never get well until you position yourself. In other words, until you went to the doctor, you ain't going to get well. Until you get in the house and you get in the kingdom, you realize you're part of the colony. And this constitution was written for you. Amen. It's my constitution. If you look at it, it's a little bit different. Because we over here in, in, in America, we don't see it. We don't understand kingdom. We don't understand kings. We don't understand queens. I, 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 I'm mesmerized by it. And I mean, I study King Henry VIII and Elizabeth and Bloody Mary and all that bunch, man. I, I see what's going on. But then I look at this king. This is a different king. This is a benevolent king. This is a kind king. This is a king that does miracles. Amen. This is my king, King Jesus. Lord, I thank you for putting us into the kingdom of God. Lord, you gave us a mandate, so I pray we all step up with the mission and the message. God, that we're not afraid to share it. And when people catch it, it's amazing what it does to them. They realize that they are part of something greater than they It's more than a building. We're part of a great colony of believers on this earth with a constitution. And we're not governed by what we see on TV here on the radio. It's by this book. So help us stand fast with it. Now, God, I close this prayer tonight again, asking for relief to those in Kimco, the first responders, all of those that were involved in the plant outside of Crosby, Texas today, when it, and when it uh, exploded part of the plant. I pray for the bereaved family. I can't imagine not, not having a loved one come home not supposed to be that way. So God, I pray that you be with them. And as they begin to go back through that plant, I pray for security in that place. I pray that your angels be around them. God, I believe it was your angels there that protected so many of those men and women that were there. So God, I ask you to help and give them wisdom, give them understanding, give them the ability to do whatever it takes to secure that place for the blessing and the safety of the men and women of this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.